Good morning. There you are. How are you? Doing. Great. It's nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we have um, most members of House Education here with us. Um, this is obviously a subject of interest to them as well. So um, uh, we've just spent the last few minutes uh, looking at sort of, um, you know, guidance that um, that Mark had uh, presented to us, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, but went back and went over it. So we have a little little bit of context, but not a whole lot. Um, and so the, the uh, purpose of asking you and Brad to join us today is to look at the I never know whether I should call it 30 million or 27 million, but that that bucket of money um, and uh, get your thoughts about how it is, how it will be distributed, number one, um, and also whether how um, and um, in what way it should affect the education payment that goes out to school districts um, and um, you know, we're interested in the uh, administration's recommendation on that subject. We haven't made any decisions. We've had actually fairly little discussion about it, um, but we're all aware that we're looking at um, that ending fiscal 20 um, with a small deficit. Uh, used to look like a big one. Now it's looking smaller, which is good. Um, That's good news. And fiscal 21 um, with a pretty challenging um, depending on how you count the money, $166 million problem to solve. So that's the, that's the framework. Um, so uh, thank you and uh, let you go ahead and um, get started. Uh, good morning, uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. It's good to see you all. Um, yeah, it's just to start on the mechanics of the, uh, we call ESSER, uh, the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, which is a sub portion of the CARES Act uh, that's, uh, you know, 30 million, uh, the SEA or the agency can reserve up to 10%. So that's how we get down to the 27 million. Uh, agency applied for the funds, the application RF state level application was approved. Uh, we're in the process of uh, creating an application for the LEAs to apply for those funds. Uh, we put that on hold uh, this week. Uh, the US Department of Ed issued some guidance uh, two Fridays ago that uh, caught everyone's attention at the national level. And we thought the guidance might be inconsistent with the intent of Congress. So we're working with other states to get clarity on that before we um, turn on the application to LEAs, but we expect to make that decision this week. And that, that guidance just so you know, pertains to um, the calculation of what we call equitable share of services of how um, funds under the title grants in particular are required to be shared with uh, private schools. Um, the guidance that came up uh, sort of in the last 11th hour from the US Department of Ed seems to be a different interpretation of what we typically would do in terms of how we calculate that. So we're just trying to get some clarity on that. But most states thought it'd be prudent to wait till we get some clarity before we disseminate the, the dollars uh, to the low LEAs. But would you explain um, what the diff what we would normally what we would normally do and what the guidance yeah. seems to suggest. So I think just in a, a simply, uh, typically under title grants, uh, districts are required to uh, share services based on a calculation that's determined based on the poverty levels of students in their districts. And this new methodology expands it out to be the broader number of students, not just the restrictive to the students in poverty, but it basically would provide uh, the opportunity for and the requirement for greater, greater sharing of uh, these resources with private schools. So and that's, um, that's a departure from the traditional methodology that's been used under I'm Title I'm obtuse enough that I don't understand why, why that happens. Can you explain that? why why yeah. the the policy requirement is there or why the shift from poverty to all students um, pulls in the sh more sharing with private schools Can, I think that's what you said um, yeah I think the general idea is that um, the the amount that districts are required to do an equitable sharing basis if you use poverty it ends up being a much smaller amount than it would be if you used a larger population. So um, 
it, it came out very late on a Friday. And, you know, if what we've interpreted, I say we, the Council of Chief States School Officers have interpreted to be a pretty consistent um, approach from the U.S. Department of Education to consistent with the intent of Congress to put these funds out as quickly as possible to the states and to school districts and not really to interject any uh, new policy approach. And uh, this was flagged immediately as a uh, sort of a policy change consistent with the Secretary of Education's interest in voting, uh, private school choice, and so forth. So um, it's a departure for how, how the methodology has been used previously. So um, it's just, it was so inconsistent with what we've seen as a stream of consciousness, as you will, from uh, the U.S. Department of Ed in terms of approaching CARES and the COVID response uh, that it emerged pretty quickly to everyone as uh, this is a policy change and uh, something that has to be reconciled with what, what most people interpret to be the intent of Congress and CARES Act. So uh, that's being reviewed right now. But our, our, we had a choice basically to slow down the application process. If we had created an application um, that used a methodology that was flawed, that would create more problems later on. So we just we slowed down the application by a matter of days. But I can give you a more detailed response uh, as a follow up if you'd like. But I think to the the point in this conversation, just so you know. Uh, where we're at with disseminating the, the ESSSR uh, funds uh, that's been slightly delayed by, I'd say by a week until we get some clarity on that. We hope by the end of this week uh, to have that clarity. I have biweekly calls with the Council of Chief State School Officers and this will be a topic on our Tuesday call today. Uh, Scott, you had a question. Did you change your mind? Scott. So, um, so, so I'm. I'll go back and ask my question again. Um, the, the the this money under sort of the normal method would go to private schools, but by changing the basis for the distribution from poverty to all students, private schools will get more money. Is that is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, essentially districts, uh, when they receive the funds under Title I are required to do an engagement uh, conversation with the private schools in their region. And uh, the, ascent, the extent to which they provide assurance that they will share those funds uh, on a basis, on an equitable basis with the private schools in their area based on a conversation with them, previously was determined uh, consistently with Title I, the interpretation was based on a standard that restricted that pot of money to the number of students in poverty because Title I itself is essentially focused on students in poverty. This new standard essentially opens that up to a much broader sharing uh, possibility. So it's, it's really, it's a requirement that falls to the LEAs, the local districts, and we wanna be very clear in our application process because they're, they're the ones that have to sign onto the assurance at that level. So we wanna ensure we have a clear understanding of the interpretation of the law and the, the new guidance seems to be somewhat a departure from previous guidance. Yeah. Uh, Robin. Thank you. So just to be clear, this is a requirement or this is an option? It's in the assurances. So the SEA has signed, you know, we had to assign assurances uh, that the funds essentially would be used in accordance with the law. Uh, the LEAs, the school districts also have to sign the same assurances. Um, but what happened was the U.S. Department of Education put out guidance explaining on what particular item of assurance uh, means. And uh, actually on Monday, they put out further embellished, frequently asked questions about this issue as well. So it's in the assurances. So, okay, so does that mean it's a requirement that we have to share with all schools, all populations, not just with people in poverty? school districts have a requirement to ensure okay. when they sign off and receiving these funds that they distribute those funds in a manner consistent with the, with the, the law. Okay, thank you. So it sounds from what you're saying that um, you're trying to get the money out quickly. Is that- That's correct. And that, that's been the intent all along for Congress and for the states. Um, we've had some discussion, not much, <laughs> about whether the money should be distributed in fiscal 20 or 21. Um, if it gets distributed in 20, it's basically on top of whatever the districts have already received from us. So that money um, can't 
then be used to offset some of the costs in fiscal 21. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, we, you know, we understand our obligation to get the funds out as soon as possible. Um, we've looked, I guess, more practically on the issue of uh, to what extent we could implement, I'll call it a clawback for a lack of a better term, uh, and now, um, and we think it's problematic to do that now. Um, we think it could be implemented after July 1 for fiscal year 21, but I think it's due to the timing of the end of the fiscal year, it would be very challenging to implement that now. Um, but we do, it's our understanding, we do have a requirement to get the funds out immediately. Right. So um, when you say it could be implemented for 21, it can't be implemented for this pot of money. That's correct. Emily. Um, thinking realistically as um, about as quickly as possible, and I heard you say you need to develop an application process with the school districts. Um, what is the timeline for that application process? We like have that more or less, we have that ready to go. We have an electronic grant dissemination process. So we've been working on setting up that. Uh, it's not, that isn't the hold up right now. It's just, we need to get clarity on this guidance and how it applies to the calculation. So we can include that in the online application. So, so can we you have a, through that timeline? Well, it hinges, I would say, assuming we get some clarity, and I think this week uh, we internally have set a goal to um, working with our partner states to understand how this federal guidance should be applied to that methodology. Assuming we get that this week, then I would expect the application to go live next week. And then when would responses be due? Uh, it doesn't, there's no deadline per se in that regard. Uh, the LEAs would be able to start applying and filling that out, but we'd help them. There's no deadline in that regard in terms of the application, but we, then, would, we would essentially have the application live next week, I would expect. And then after the application goes live, how soon do you foresee disseminating the funds based on the applications that are coming in? Yeah, I'd have to, that, the mechanics of that aren't overly clear to me. That's pretty far down in the, in the, the process of how the funds arrive here and so forth, but I would think uh, the commitments would be available and districts would be able to draw down the funds pretty pretty quickly. Okay, and I'm just asking because I'm, and I'm sorry I didn't say this at the beginning, I'm thinking about how close we are to July 1st and whether, you know, and best intentions aside, we might wind up in after July whether we want to or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily likely, um, but you know, I think really the it's been a very expedited process. Um, other than the fact of this this guidance hiccup, um, but I, I I would expect you know my initial prediction was that districts would have their funding commitments by the middle of May, like by the end of next week. Um, so we're maybe a week off on that due to this guidance delay, but I still think we're on track uh, for this month. I said Emily, yeah, uh, Scott. Yeah, I just um, want to add here that there's a, a further complicating factor on these title dollars um, because most title dollars are received prior to, uh, they're known before the budget process and these budget votes and they filter their way in a, in a variety of different ways to the publics and the independents. Some independents don't take title dollars, but that works itself out in the budgeting. This is a little different because these dollars are becoming available for FY21 when FY21 has already been voted on. So um, we'll, I guess we'll have to see what comes out of the uh, Department of Education, but this is, this is pretty unusual. Yeah, I would, I would say typically districts are able to project what their, you know, say title funds are. The title funds are basically allocations based on census data. So um, when they're presenting their budgets to the voters, uh, they usually, it, this varies, but districts, uh, you know, are required to present a budget that includes all of their education spending, including costs that they might have attributed or tagged to grant funds that are coming into the title grants. So there is a prediction usually in districts um, when they present their budget materials to the voters of how, what their allocations will be. Um, but there's, in the last several years, the last eight years or so, there's been uh, challenges to doing that as, you know, the federal government, due to political reasons, has delayed those allocations or what have you. Um, but it's not, it's not necessarily uh, 
uh, atypical that districts don't have their grants in hand uh, after much after town meeting date. So this isn't that unusual in that regard. Of course, this is a totally unanticipated funding stream. Um, and the uh, I just say the the linkage when we start talking about how these grants or how these funds can be used, they're allocated to the school district based on the same methodology that we use for Title I, but they don't have to be spent in accordance with Title I. There's, there's approximately 12 different ways they can spend the funds. It's fairly flexible. Um, and as long as essentially the districts are using their funds um, consistent with a, a, an established federal education program, they have great latitude in determining how they use those funds. And similarly, uh, the agency, uh, the, the SEA is prohibited from really restricting how LEAs use those funds. That's that's in the guidance as well. Uh, you all set? Yeah. Uh, Kate. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I am looking at uh, number 11 on the allowable uses, which has to do with um, implementing summer learning and supplement supplemental after school programs, um, which indicates that clearly we should be able to use some in FY21. But what my question, it has to do with how does this relate to IDEA funds, special ed funds for students that will be required to be receiving compensatory education for lack of meeting progress on their goals? Yeah, it's a complex question. Um, so Representative Webb refers to this uh, concept of compensatory services in special education. Those are services that uh, have been deemed to be necessary or required. A district is required to provide those services, usually as a result of going through a due process proceeding where the parent contends the student has fallen behind and, and therefore essentially the, uh, through the hearing processes, the district is ordered to provide compensatory service to the student to get them back on track. Um, you know, our understanding of that, and this is still, you know, special ed guidance is evolving relative to COVID-19, is that uh, compensatory requirement really won't be even contemplated to a certain extent until we sort of declare we're heading back to normal, if you will, for the regular ed environment. And, um, you know, part of, part of the contention that's underway now is, is this summer going to be a return to normal or not? And, our expectation is that it's not necessarily that the fall will not necessarily be, you know, the, the emergency is not over. So uh, we'll still be in some sort of modified form of continuity of learning for some time, uh, though it's certainly our expectation that we'll return to in-person instruction. So, you know, we using the term compensatory education might not be applicable yet, but we certainly uh, want to use the summer to uh, prepare students for su successful entry into that fall, even though the fall won't necessarily be the new normal, or what will be the new normal, won't be the old normal. So we, uh, we know districts, um, you know, will have costs related to um, students falling behind, all students, including our special needs students. And, and that's the hard, when we start thinking about this sort of clawback moment, if you will, um, we think we have the opportunity to, to do something in 21 relative to allocating, uh, allocating CARES Act funds to districts and considering uh, the impact on the Ed Fund and so forth and so on. And um, where it's cha more challenging is when we start thinking about what are the cost implications of the COVID-19 emergency. We can, we can sort of do, and Brad can walk you through that a little bit of, you know, how much districts have spent today in, you know, there's ups and downs in district budgets uh, across the board, but what we can't really quantify now are these student uh, support costs that are really, you know, if you think about the wake of this emergency and one of its impact is fully measured after it's, it is over, um, you know, that those costs are going to be significant, both in compensatory services and other social emotional supports for students. And it's, that's the thing that's really hard to quantify at this point. Um, so when we start thinking about I keep using the word clawback, the, the use of the ESSER funds, which are, you know, once again, the 27 million, the ESSER funds um, have a timeline. I, I believe school districts can use those funds through September of 21. So they have a greater trajectory on those funds than we do under the CRF funds. So CRF funds, the, the big pot of money that's available at the state level, I believe that's through December of 20. So 
when we start thinking about a sort of a clawback approach where if we were to um, essentially short districts their ESSER allocation, but then seek to hold them harmless through CRF funding because CRF could be applied to school district expenses. One of the, the challenges with that is gonna be around the time of that. So because the CRF funds more or less, I believe expire in December 20, where ESSER funds expire in 21. Um, so we, we have to ensure, particularly on the issue of student supports that we don't have our arms around too well yet, that that'll emerge, I think, towards the, more towards the tail end of the crisis specifically. Um, that that's, that's something that's very much on our radar as we've been contemplating some of these challenging uh, financial uh, dynamics. I mean, one of the other problems is that the uh, CRF money is much more restricted in terms of how it can be used. And the, yeah. um, the uh, ESSER, is that what you call it? This, this other yeah. pot money, this 27 million, um, has uh, is a lot more flexibility in it. So I'm, I'm concerned um, about the push to get the money out more quick as quickly as possible because if there is any um, any ability to claw it back um, and keep the districts whole um, I, the fact that we put it out in fiscal 20 is going to um, shut off those options um, so I, I don't know um, not sure exactly where that thinking is leading me other than as you, as you talk and as we talk about, and I, I'd love to hear from Brad a little bit more about what's happening in the schools. I don't want to get too far out into yeah. the education committee's world, but, um, but as, as I listen to you, what I've got flashing in red in front of me is $166 million. Um, right. and that's the money we've got to come up with in 21. And um, that that is not going to uh, be solved on the backs of property taxpayers, I don't believe. I don't think it can be. Um, and there have got to be, the, we have got to leave ourselves as much room as possible to solve that problem with federal money. And um, right. pushing this money out quickly may foreclose that option with a, a, a fairly substantial piece of federal money. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, there the districts are allowed to carry these funds forward beyond the end of the fiscal year. So they're, you know, they once again have through 21. So, um, you know, when I've seen managed other title funds of a similar nature, I mean, those those balances carry forward in not in their essentially their local general funds, but in discrete funds. You know, they they use fund based accounting. So they're, um, I'm not sure to what extent issuing the the funds now is intended and possibly required by the law would restrict our options um, because I think the funds are still going to be there. And I guess the question would be to what extent does that impact their funding decision, you know, their spending decisions now, um, which, which could manifest itself in the form of unanticipated surpluses, uh, which once again still could create the flexibility we're looking for in the next fiscal year. Um, but, you know, it's hard to say at this point with and, and Brad can give you a sense of this. It's, you know, districts have been impacted very differently to date um, relative to COVID-19. So it's not like all districts are experiencing the same effects, but then we know uh, to Representative Webb's point, there's gonna be a bunch of activity in the summer that is unanticipated, uh, both in terms of feeding students and uh, summer programming and so forth and planning programming just to, to prepare for the fall. So, um, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll end my comments there. I see Mark's okay. yeah. uh, I'm gonna, uh, Emily had a question. So I'm, um, do you want to, Emily, you want to do Mark first or you want to jump in? Um, if I could, that would be great. It's just a clarification. Yeah, you, go ahead. Uh, you said that districts are permitted to roll over the funds. Is it possible for us to require them to roll over the funds? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if, um, if I'm confusing with the semantics or not, I don't. I don't think it's uh, it's necessarily requires us to to tell them how to handle the money. I think the, the how they handle the money is, is a function of what the law requires, and I think it's set up in a manner that they will be carrying these funds over um, beyond the fiscal year. So I think I I guess what I was trying to understand the logic was if if the money is given out prior to June 30, 
that somehow districts uh, will spend all that money now between now and June 30 and therefore won't have those funds beyond June 30 and that would be a problem. I don't I don't see districts spending all their this money prior to June 30. I think, um, I think that the issue is that the way our law is structured that we our education payment is based on the budget that they vote. Um, and right. it doesn't bridge fiscal years when, once we're done gotcha. with fiscal 20 we're done um, and then when we then we have to pick up fiscal 21 so there, if there's no bridge in terms of that money that money is um, it's uh, so I don't know Mark wants to jump in and he'll he'll help me out <laughs> yeah so um, I, I'm not looking at the actual guidance I'm looking at my summary of it but um, unless I read it wrong, um, the guidelines provide that funds can be awarded within one year of receipt. So if the funds can be awarded within one year of receipt, I don't see why they can't be delayed until after June 30th before the awards get made, in which case you could use, then, use, that, use it as an offsetting revenue in FY21, which would really help this problem that we're facing right now. Um, I don't see anything in the language that requires any rush to get these monies out the door before June 30th. But um, I, I can go back and check the regulations again. But that's that's what I'm reading right now. So, hey, I'll have to go and check that. Well, I know there was the 30-day requirement for the federal government to uh, issue the applications yeah. to us, and right. they they did they right. did meet that deadline. I thought there was a similar uh, requirement for us, but I can I, verify that as well. I think that there's a, there's there's a 30 a 30 day um, application period, and then the applications have to be acted on within 30 days. But in terms of reallocation from the Agency of Education to the individual SUs, I think you have up to a whole year to sit on that money before you allocate it. And I just want to point out that this is a pretty weighty decision. So I want to be really careful how we make it. Um, uh, Kate, uh, Brad wants to jump in, but Kate, you had a question first. You're, you're, uh, you need to unmute. It can be answered. It can be answered later because it's a little bit off this topic. So, oh, okay, Brad, go ahead. I, I was just going to say I, I agree with what Mark said that that um, there is there is nothing in the federal legislation that says we need to get that out the door immediately. We do have up to the districts have up to September twenty one to obligate the money. Um, and Secretary French is correct in that there was a big push from the federal government to get the money out as quickly as possible to us in thirty days, and there are thirty day limits there. But in terms of us getting money out to them, no. I don't believe there is. I guess I would like to uh, formally ask uh, the agency to slow down until we have a really clear idea of what, what impact this is going to have, particularly on the problems that we've gotten 21. Um, yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to brainstorm this with you, and yeah. we want to okay. definitely coordinate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kate. What do you see looking forward as the greatest areas of requests that you will see coming from the districts? And what do you see as um, highest and best use of these funds? More of an ed question, ed, ed committee question, ways and means committee. Yeah. I think, you know, you can certainly, um, what we're seeing as a strategic planning exercise uh, being promoted by the Council of Chief State School Officers is, you know, based on patterns of need that we're seeing in districts and that that strategic planning framework has four domains. And I think it's fair to say, you know, those sort of encapsulate a lot of uh, the activities districts would be seeking reimbursement for. Uh, one of them being continuity of learning. So just the provisioning of teaching online and uh, the related student supports to do instruction uh, online, remote learning, if you will. Uh, the area of uh, conditions for learning, which is, speaks to the, the in-person instruction and in the learning environment. So you think of things like disinfection supplies, uh, provisioning of meals, uh, thermometers, masks, PPE, that, that kind of level. Um, we have the issue of sort of governance and policy uh, work, probably this, I would say, not as big a container as those other two, but districts will have um, needs uh, around uh, legal support and developing policies and procedures to uh, enact the requirements, um, whether that be con interpreting contracts and so forth. Um, but I think, you know, those are those, those major areas, particularly student support areas, I think are the ones that are the ones that we really don't have a good handle on now. And I think those are the ones that we'll see emerge um, 
you know, certainly as this as this uh, our trajectory with uh, responding to the virus stabilizes more or less as we're managing it better. You know, I'm having a lot of conversations with the mental health folks and so forth. So I think we'll see a lot of that sort of infrastructure need uh, emerge as probably the more uh, costly items relative to supporting our response to the crisis. Uh, let me see if others have questions. Anyone? Can I jump in? Um, so if we... Bill Talbot has... Oh, I'm sorry? Robin, didn't see you. Bill, Bill Talbot is raising his hand. He is. Bill, go ahead. Uh, hi, Janet. I'm not sure how... Can I ask a question of Dan and Brad? Yeah. Sure. Bill, it's good to see you. Hey, hey Mr. Secretary, how are you? <laughs> so, you just um, meet the strangest people here, don't you? I know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's strange too. Um, this, is a, this is a timing issue with that, with that money we were just discussing. Janet mentioned earlier about the possibility of using Summer All of It as an offsetting revenue in FY21. If that were to happen, when do you need to have that information to, uh, for the tax rate setting? I, th I think I think really if 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 we were going to go that route right now, I think what we would just simply need to say is this is how much you're going to get. Um, we we already know the percentages because I've calculated those in the background, um, and all I need is that final that final figure to do the allocations, and then just let people know. And you would so just I think do it, it can be done anytime. And you would just do it uh, when you put the information together for the tax department, just. Added in there. Well, I, I would no. I mean, it would still it would still depend on what the the districts report to us because we don't. I don't think we would be in. I would hesitate just add it in to what to what the report to us as an additional revenue. I think they would we would need to say this is what you've got because remember this goes to the SUs. Right, um, doesn't go to the district. And, and, so, and so I don't know how they're going to divvy it out between the districts. So that's the question: is then when do the districts have to let you know? Well, well, theoretically, um, June one. Um, because that's when budgets are due, um, but we always give them a little, a little bit of latitude in that. But so you, you know, so we we've got basically three four weeks we can do it. Okay, so so then okay, so all right, okay, thank you. So I I think what you two were talking about was what I was asking about, but maybe not. Um, the uh, my <laughs> my my uh, simpler put question was. If we decided we wanted to claw the money back in fiscal 21, um, what's the process for doing that? How does that happen? And can, is that something the agency can do? Is that what you were asking, Bill? Yes. Yes. I think we can, we can do it. <laughs> I think we've discussed, but yeah. yeah. We've done it in the past. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, 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 it can it can be done, yes. Okay. I was just worried about the timing of it all. If it was, if it, you know, I'm happened. worried about the timing. I, I, right. I, I don't know if this is the path we want to go down, but I don't okay. want to, I don't want to shut a door so that we can't um, right. at this stage. Uh, Mark. To um, I'm, I'm wondering um, from Brad, is, is there any reason why the legislature couldn't dictate how the supervisory unions allocate these funds to their to their members? Yeah, I don't know. Um, the guidance, you know, it talks about the in, through the SEA anyway, having limited ability to direct uh, how LEAs uh, in the LEA in this case being the supervisory and how they how they do that. But I think that that might get into sort of a gray area of how the allocations are determined. Um, I don't know, Brad. What do you think? I I, I, th I think it may. Um, I, I hesitate to say that that they could. Um, I think it would be. You know, it's, it really says the LEAs get to determine how that money's used. And again, as I said to, to Bill, and you just mentioned Mark, our LEAs in this case are our supervisory unions. In a lot of cases, that's a single district, think Burlington, um, um, Springfield, et cetera. But there's still SUs out there with multiple school districts. And I, we will be given it to the SU, and I don't know how they will be allocated out to the school districts. But, but if they're, if they're just... They're just agents of the state. Why can't we tell them that, that you've received X amount from the federal government for this program? It's going to be allocated to the districts on the same basis as we because, allocate because the money. I, th I think the I think the answer to that, Mark, is because the 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 CARES Act tells us how we're going to allocate that money out based on the Title One allocation. 
and then it clearly says that it's up to the LEAs how to spend the money and that we don't have any say in. Okay. Yeah, what I'd say, back to the idea of being gray, um, you know, most states aren't configured, you know, with multiple districts as part of LEA. So in most states, if not outside of Northern New England, all LEAs are, are districts, you know, yeah. a single district, so. And, 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 oh, sorry. Uh -huh. I, I was just gonna... <laughs> go ahead. You go. When, when we, when we, when we uh, I guess we didn't do it. Never mind. I was thinking about the arrow money and how we distributed that, but that went actually into the education fund. So it yeah. bypassed the no, whole process. The, 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 the clawback we did was on the teacher health care a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, that's that's where we really did it. Um, and I was just I was just going to go back to your to your question, Janet. Um, the way where I was talking to Mark and Bill and, and Dan was kind of kind of two pronged is is that there there's your idea of, of letting them have the money and then clawing it back. There's the second idea, which I don't know if Bill mentioned or I mentioned or somebody did, um, where you, you give it to them as a revenue and it reduces their education costs that they are going to draw down from the end fund. Yeah. So it's, you kind of end up with the same result more or less, yeah. not right. quite close. Yeah, and the and the latter one may make more sense. Um, uh, questions? Anyone? If we did want to say something about this, um, you know, the, the property tax bill would be a place where we could do it. Um, I'm just not sure that we're really clear about what it is that we want to do at this point. Um, no one else? Um, were there other things that um, that you wanted to let us know about this pot of money? What about the four and a half million? Can you? So I have actually two questions: the three million, the ten percent that you're allowed to retain. Um, uh, can you tell us what your plan is about that, and also talk about the four and a half million? Yeah, we haven't. Uh, uh, say we inside the agency and, and the administration haven't developed a firm plan yet for. Uh, the three million. We are, I think, acknowledging that student supports, uh, as I mentioned earlier, will emerge as a priority. So we're thinking it would be prudent to reserve the maximum at the state level and probably reallocate those funds out in some sort of uh, grant process to address the, the areas of student support that emerge as the most critical statewide. Uh, we have, um, I think, if that, if that sort of logic plays out, that would uh, reserve about two thirds of the 10% for that. Um, we're also allowed, I should mention, to reserve um, half of 1% of the 10% for administrative costs, so we intend to uh, do that as well. And then we had a couple um, projects relative to the emergency response immediately, uh, basically uh, a help desk to stand up our ability to handle communications from the field and also to provision a system for uh, continuity learning and teaching online. So those those two would probably be together somewhere around 700,000. Uh, but I think the, the bulk of it, we would try to figure out how to address the social emotional needs of students uh, from state level activities. The 4.4 million in the Governor's Emergency Education Emergency Relief Fund, uh, that grant application was submitted and approved recently. So uh, the application has been approved and um, there has been no, there's basically three ways that money can be used. Uh, the governor's basically, uh, you know, said he, he wants to work closely with the legislature and figuring out how to use those funds. Uh, but the four, or say the three ways those funds can be used. One is uh, to address uh, the needs of some LEAs that have been most critically uh, affected by COVID-19. That's one of the permissible uses. A second permissible use is uh, institutes of higher education that it might have been adversely affected by COVID-19. And the third bucket is more general. It could include uh, social emotional supports for students. It could be LEAs, it could be other organizations that have been involved uh, from an educational perspective with the COVID-19 relief. So there's fairly flexible approach there um, with the 4.4 million that the governor has expressed an interest in working closely with you on determining how those funds get spent. But the application has been approved. Um, so that was accomplished last week. Uh, I um, asked this question uh, before you joined us, but is that a, a grant that needs to go through the Joint Fiscal uh, Committee grant acceptance? I process? believe so. 
I believe so. I, I had a role in getting the application process because it went through the U.S. Department of Education, mm -hmm. um, but the finance office could answer that more directly. Yeah, that one sounds to me more like it is the, the 30 million, um, because it goes directly to schools. I'm not sure that that is one that we would be involved with. Um, uh, let's see, other questions? Anyone has anything else you wanted to share with us? Awesome. I think, you know, we're, we're working closely. I mean, uh, Brad and our team, um, you know, whatever we can do to help. And um, we appreciate the opportunity to brainstorm through this with you. Um, you know, um, there's definitely, there's no easy solutions with it, so. Yeah, and speaking of brainstorming, um, I haven't uh, sort of issued an invitation to do this yet, but I'm thinking on Thursday of inviting you and uh, Commissioner Gresham and Commissioner Bolio to join the committee to sort of have a discussion about really fiscal 21 sort of the, how we how we resolve that so um hope your schedule is open it'd be about the same time 10 o'clock on yeah. Thursday. well we'll um, make it open that's great it would be very good to do that and, um uh sarita has a question hi secretary um hi. i'm wondering if um part of that money, the 4 million, when you talk about higher institutions, could that possibly be used to help fund the bridge uh, funding that they are possibly talking about to, you know, problem solve the issue with um, our state colleges? Yeah, I don't, uh, my reading of the guidance uh, indicates that it wouldn't prohibit you from spending it in that manner. I think it's pretty flexible. It's something I think you'd have to, um, you know, decide how you want to prioritize the use of those funds. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just just one last thought on, on my, my part, and that has to do with the delay that we have to Act 173, our bill uh, designed to, you know, for students who need additional support. If there's some way we can find using the COVID money to address some of the broader, uh, broader training, teacher training that we wanted in that bill, that I think could be justified as a COVID related expense, given the number of students who are gonna be falling behind. Yeah, and that's exactly where we're going in terms of when we think about student supports that emerge through COVID-19, I think there's an opportunity to align that with the broader goals of providing student supports that are really the, the essential design element of Act 173. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope we get to see you Thursday. I haven't, I <laughs> I haven't actually set that up yet, but I'm working on it. Um, Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Uh, and Brad, thank you too. You're welcome to welcome to stay if you want.